Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good afternoon. Welcome to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii, where we discuss the impact of change on the community. I'm your host, Cheryl Crozier Garcia, and today we're going to try and make sense out of recent events in the news, specifically that involve the United States Supreme Court. Joining me today is station manager and all around good guy, Jay Fidel, uh, and we're going to talk about the implications of the Kavanaugh nomination and confirmation and how this will affect not only the Supreme Court going forward for the next 40 or 50 years, but also how the Supreme Court decisions affect us as a community. Mm. So welcome, Jay. Thanks for having me on the show, Cheryl. You're very welcome. <laughs> so um, you are an attorney by profession and by education. So you got a lot more experience and training in what the Supreme Court is and what it does, maybe than the rest of us who got nothing more than 10th grade civics. So <laughs> what is the Supreme Court supposed to do and why is it an important branch of government? First, you have to appreciate that most lawyers go through their careers, they have no contact with the Supreme Court at all. Okay. Uh, they read the, you know, the reports of the decisions. Uh, they certainly cite the decisions in their briefs and arguments, um, but they don't get down there much. I was there way back when in the mm, 60s to mm -hmm. be sworn in as, as right, to be, to be sworn in before the Supreme Court. Wow. The, um, the uh, what do you call it, the Solicitor General was my sponsor. Uh -huh. I was in the military at the time, and I was sworn into the Supreme Court. That was the only time I've been in the building, <laughs> okay? Um, other friends of mine, relatives of mine, have been there much more often. Point is that most lawyers don't have a lot of contact with the Supreme Court. Uh, on the other hand, it's certainly worth reading and writing about. Uh, it is the, you know, it, it, it states the law of the land, it finds the law of the land. Um, and it is an important American institution by virtue of the Constitution. We must have confidence in it. Um, the whole, our whole legal and democratic infrastructure requires that we have confidence in it. And so this event with uh, Brett Kavanaugh has, for a lot of people, shaken that confidence. Mm -hmm. Why? Is it, is it just because of the stories of his uh, childhood and teenage years coming out, or is it the judicial decisions that he has made? What was it about this particular Supreme Court justice that that really shook the foundations mm -hmm. of the court? Well, the story, the story about uh, you know Professor Ford and all that. Um, I don't, I don't think that's the major thing that shook the confidence in Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, I think when you look closely, you find that some of the decisions he wrote, they might shake your, uh, your confidence, and some of the positions he took, some of the ways that he handled some of the cases that, you know, that he sat on over the years, um, that, that, that might shake your confidence. But to me, the thing that shook my confidence right down to the core was that he was faced with someone who was charging him with, um, you know, sexual misconduct at the age of 17. Um, and, you know, a boys will be boys kind of drunken binge with the sexual kind. It's not, not pretty. Um, and how is he going to deal with that charge? And I believe, personally, I believe that in dealing with that charge, he opted to lie about it. He lied. And, and I have trouble with that uh, for someone who is being nominated for the Supreme Court of the United States. That's a very high office, perhaps one of the highest offices, um, you know, legally, it is the highest office in the country. Um, and when you conclude that if she was telling the truth, then he had to be lying. If you believe she was telling the truth, you have to believe he was lying. And if he was lying because he so clearly denied everything, um, you have to believe he's not qualified to serve. And that's the part that shakes your confidence. The, the lying. Aspect, but, well, they were both under oath, so they promised to tell the truth, and and under penalty of perjury, they uh, were obligated to report well, what they knew. Like in an open perjury and isn't going to go anywhere here, but uh, you know, the thing about it is, he had options. He could have said, "Well, I, you know, I remember some of that. I, I wasn't behaving very well that day," 
But I think he concluded as a strategical matter that that would cost them the nomination mm -hmm. and that Trump would have to withdraw it or the committee would not be in a, in a position and, you know, because of the, the pushback on that mm -hmm. to actually confirm him. Mm -hmm. um, so he opted, in my view, he opted to lie. And, uh, okay, it's a choice. Uh, and then, of course, I think the, the you know, the, the model he got from the people around him, uh, including the White House, was, well, uh, if, if you're getting heat because people claim you're lying, then double down on the lie. Mm -hmm. You know, be, be strident as you can, mm -hmm. which is what he did. And the president was proud of him for the statements he made on Fox News, friendly Fox News, and the Wall Street Journal, friendly Fo Wall Street Journal, and, of course, in the hearing room last week. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's how he got through, and it, it succeeded. It succeeded, but it, it doesn't give you confidence. No, no. I was actually, um, I, I've made it a point of doing this ever since the Clarence Thomas nomination, way back in my early university days. When the president appoints a nominee to the Supreme Court, I make it a point to run down to the law library, and now I Google, to look at that person's decisions, you know, the kinds of things that they said on the bench. Because, in theory, they will decide the same way if other, if similar issues come before them on the Supreme Court. Um, so I looked at Judge Kavanaugh's history with his judicial decisions. And for those reasons alone, and this was before any of those other accusations came forward, I would have said no. He, I would not support him on the Supreme what Court. What were the things that bothered you, Cheryl? Well, I think the first thing in my mind was going all the way back to the, to the, um, Clinton administration and the fact that it was, Kavanaugh was one of the key members on the Starr investigative report team who put forward the accusation that the Clintons had had something to do with the death of Vince Foster, which was proven to be a suicide, and the Clintons were completely exonerated. But that is a rumor that has continued to besmirch uh, the reputation. Sort of like the birther issue. Kind of. With President Obama where uh, Trump has, did continue um, to push that, uh, even after it was obvious uh, how, how wrong he was. Mm -hmm. um, and even after he, he acknowledged that it was not true, he still pushed it, and the people around him pushed it. It's just extraordinary. Anyway, right. sorry. So that was the first thing. The second thing was his decision on the case in Texas about a young girl who uh, had a right to an abortion. She was pregnant. And, uh, b but because she was a ward of the court, the court, I guess, had to approve it under Texas law. And Judge Kavanaugh sat on that decision, hoping to run the clock out so that medically she would be too far along in her pregnancy to go through with a medical procedure. And under Texas law, it would be beyond the limitation of weeks. Right. I remember that, and it was, it was, that was um, covered by the media in yeah. detail. And so that was my second reason to, to not feel that he would be the best choice. And the third one was something entirely personal. You know, uh, Judge Kavanaugh and Justice Gorsuch went to high school together. They went to the same high school. They graduated around the same time. And I had to look at, look at that and, as a graduate of Waipahu High School, say to myself, you know what, if there were two former marauders on the Supreme Court, would that start some kind of, you know, would, would people come forward and say, no, we cannot have two Waipahu people <laughs> on the court? And so there's, there's kind of a, like a nepotistic feeling that I didn't approve of. In terms of getting a court that reflects the diversity of this nation, having two guys that went to the same high school does not seem to me to be the best way to bring about diversity. So we were three, I was three for three, and I was like, nah, I don't think so, but my vote doesn't count. Uh, it's the Senate and the president who make the decisions about who sits on the court. Yeah. Well, one of the, one of the things um, you know you you mentioned um, is his participation in uh, Republican political activities over the term of his career, which is not actually that long relative to other judges we have seen appointed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, usually they're older, and I think Republicans like to have young judges so that. The, the judge will be on the bench for years and years and years. And that is exactly what's going to happen with Kavanaugh. He's going to be there like for 40 years. Oh, gosh. Anyway, um, so one of, the, uh, one of the issues that struck me is that he was a Republican right-wing operative. That's how he has built his career. 
that has a lot to do with the fact that he's on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals bench. Mm -hmm. um, he has done, he has paid his dues as a right-wing conservative. Um, he's got an agenda, and you saw that when you saw him in his strident remarks to the Senate committee, uh, I guess, last Thursday, uh, mm -hmm. um, which was really, um, that shook confidence. Yeah. This is going to be a, a, a Supreme Court judge, a man who carries the wisdom to lead the nation judicially, to find our moral fiber, mm -hmm. to find the, you know, the parameters of our democracy. Um, it didn't look like that to me. But worse, he's completely politicized. And he is going to do what that party wants him to do. So if that party wants him to knock off Roe v. Wade, my, set, my sense of it is that he will do exactly that. Uh, if the issue comes up as to whether Trump could pardon himself or his family for crimes that would otherwise be prosecuted or that are otherwise prosecuted, uh, he will do that because he's an operative. I think we can expect that. And I hope the press is watching. Hope the press is watching every word he writes, every question he asks in those hearings, mm -hmm. so that we know what we got here. Uh, and we can see whether, you know, this was what the Senate committee said they thought it was or something else. Mm -hmm. Now, we do have an, eight other judge, justices. The, the, we don't just have one justice that makes the decision about whether something is law. So, so Justice Kavanaugh's voice will will be um, part of a committee voice. In yeah, a sense. But the majority of the court is now now on the right side of things. But that that implies that the entire Supreme Court and not Justice Kav not just they all Justice have their Kavanaugh, they all have their have agendas. Uh, well, agenda or you know inclinations on various issues, and I think it's clear that now the court is a five to four court or better on the right hand side of things. This is very troubling. And he is, he is a solid uh, conservative on the court. I mean, a died of the wool conservative. Mm -hmm. So, um, that, you know, that's what we got. And um, uh, it reminds me of Susan, uh, Susan, um, the senator. Collins. Collins. What she said when she made her statement explaining her, her vote on this, uh, she, was, she was a swing man, so one of the swing group, if you will, uh, that could have... It could have voted otherwise, and people were watching her so carefully about that. Um, but she said to explain her yes vote, to confirm, she said she wanted to see him on there because there, were, there was too much argument on the Supreme Court, and they needed Kavanaugh to make peace, to bring people together. Uh, and, and that would be better than having all these five to four decisions all the time. I said, what a crock. But aren't you uh, supposed to have five to four decisions? That we have to argue both sides of a situation, right? You have to have right? a Supreme Court that handles the issues, that deals with it, addresses with it. And if they differ, that's okay. We want that. Um, she wants to see nine to zero. And she thinks he's her ticket uh, to be nine to zero. I said, this is kind of amazing that a United States senator would know so little about the United States Supreme Court. You really wonder about what school she went to and, and how she perceives, um, you know, her, her own government. Mm -hmm. um, so you really wonder about the Senate, actually. Yeah, that's true. Although the vast majority of senators come out of the legal profession. Lots of them are lawyers. Mm -hmm. uh, and legislators in general. Yeah. Why is that? Well, I think it's mm, government is connected with the law. The law is connected with government, um, you know, and uh, lawyers are good campaigners, I guess. They're mm -hmm. articulate. Um, and uh, lawyers like to run for office because they know that's where the power is. So it's a natural. It's always been that way. It'll continue to be that yeah. way. Speaking of power, we have the power to talk about some of the other great uh, programming here on Think Tech Hawaii. So we are going to take a break, uh, but we'll be right back. So sit tight. This is Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia, and Jay Fidel and I will be back in 60 seconds. Stay tuned. Hello, and welcome to Out of the Comfort Zone. I am your villainous host, R.B. Kelly. Today we are playing two truths and a lie, and I will tell you two truths, and you will tell me which one is the lie. Truth number one, this is a real mustache. Truth number two, I want you to watch my show on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. So tune in and let me know which is the truth and which is the lie.
I'm R.B. Kelly with Out of the Comfort Zone, and show up next Tuesday to see my mustache live. Hello, my name is Stephanie Mock, and I'm one of three hosts of Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pumai Weigert, and we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m., and we hope we'll see you next time. Welcome back to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia, and today we are talking Supreme Court with Jay Fidel. Hi, Jay. Hi, Cheryl. Well, nice back. to nice to be with you. It's good to be with you. Um, so we've been talking about the Supreme Court, and one of the things that is uh, an issue, I think, in a lot of people's minds, is that unlike other uh, judgeships in other places on the continental U.S. Uh, the Supreme Court is not elected. They are appointed and then confirmed by the Senate. So if we don't like decisions that the Supreme Court uh, is, are making on our behalf, what's the fix? They serve for life. They're there, not elected. There is no fix. That's the problem here. There's nothing you can do about it. They make a decision, and it's final, final, final. Mm -hmm. I suppose the, um, the legislature, the Congress, can override uh, some decisions. And in some cases, I suppose you'd need a constitutional amendment mm -hmm. to override some mm -hmm. decisions. Um, but there's not too much you can do. I, and I suppose the impeachment process might apply uh, if a Supreme Court justice uh, acted badly. Mm -hmm. uh, that hasn't happened, uh, as far as I know. So. What we have here is finality, huge, huge finality. Yeah. What about using the power of the ballot to bring about some change? I mean, bear in mind, um, it was President Bush the first that nominated Clarence Thomas, and then he was confirmed. And then it was uh, George W. Bush that uh, made additional appointments. Um, Chief Justice Roberts, who incidentally has a Hawaii connection via the Rice v. Cayetano decision. Uh, and then others, uh, President Obama nominated Justices Kagan and Sotomayor. Well, that raises an interesting question that you have all these comings and goings. Uh -huh. They do die. They do, um, like Kennedy, they do retire. Um, and so maybe you could say that if the, the decision was bad, look the case of Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. It was the law. Even uh, Kavanaugh said, it's settled law. I think that was a twist of phrase. I think that was a lawyer's tricky remark when he said that. It's settled law until it's unsettled law. Then it's not settled law anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, don't fool with us, Judge. Um, but the fact is that if you, if you have a court that adopts one rule, and then the, you know, the, the nature of the court changes, who knows? Maybe they change their minds, their philosophies. Who knows, some of them die or retire, and we have new judges of a different inclination, then they could actually reverse themselves. They could reverse a precedent that they made earlier. Mm -hmm. I guess that's happened once in a while. Oh, sure, Dred could Scott. Could happen now. Yeah. Sure, well, the Dred Scott decision that yeah, said that go. slaves who had left the slave states mm -hmm. and had run away yeah. could be returned to their owners yeah. uh, if they were the discovered outside. <laughs> That's right, and that was overturned. Yeah. So, so there have been cases. You can, yeah, there have been cases, maybe some famous cases, where uh, the law has changed, sometimes for the better. In the case of Roe v. Wade, in my opinion, a change now to uh, repeal Roe v. Wade, essentially, would be a bad change. Um, so yeah, I guess there is some relief possible if you don't like what they did in a given case. Um, to wait your time, <laughs> see changes of opinion, uh, see changes of judges, and uh, hope for a change in, in, or maybe be afraid of a change in the law. Really? Or, or, or pray to age out before that law affects you? Well, that was one of the points uh, that we were going to talk about. You know, people here in Hawaii were, you know, about five, 6,000 miles away from all of this, and although we saw, see it on television, uh, we don't think much about how it's going to affect us, but it is going to affect us. Everything that court does has an effect directly or indirectly on us. And I think if 
if this is as remarkable an appointment as you might think, as I think, a lot of people think, then it will definitely affect us. I mean, just, just Roe v. Wade all by itself. Mm -hmm. uh, Hawaii was one of the first states, if not the first state, uh, to allow abortions legally. Um, if they repeal Roe v. Wade, that'll be over. And, uh, well, no, because we'd still have state law that says that abortion is legal. I suppose so. We'll see what happens. We'll see the kind of case that comes up, and we'll see what they do with it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, right, because uh, uh, I don't remember exactly what the circumstance was at the time, but Hawaii was one of the first, if not the first. All I'm saying is that we, we see it as very distant and not affecting us, but it does affect us, and yeah. it will continue to affect us. Well, and I think if we look at Roe v. Cayetano, uh, certainly Justice Roberts' decision, again, it was an appeals court on the continental U.S., but it affects the Native Hawaiian community, and indeed all of us who are voters, every time we go to the ballot box. You know, it used to be if you were not a member of the Kanaka Maoli community, you could not vote for OHA in Ohio elections, but now everybody can because Justice Roberts says that to deny someone the right to vote based on race or racial affiliation mm -hmm. is not legal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there are other, you know, that's a state issue that somehow has federal, uh, Im, you know, uh, implications, but there are all kinds of national issues where we, we're, we're also affected by the, you know, uh, environmental issues, immigration issues, all of the things that Trump is pulling the wings out of lately. Uh, if the Supreme Court, you know, can, as it is now constituted, uh, confirms what he's doing, that'll affect us. Uh, it'll affect our, you know, it is affecting our laws, whatever Congress does, because of supremacy. Um, but what the Supreme Court does will also affect us in, in ways that go beyond just issues that are relevant in this state. There are national issues that have an effect on our state. Mm -hmm. So I think we can, we can look forward to seeing a new time. Yeah, I just, like I said, I, I remember having a conversation with a, a good, good friend of mine who was actually my faculty mentor at university way, way back in the day. And I asked him what he thought about all of this. And he, and he had been a Vietnam era veteran. And so he, just, he said something to the effect of, I'm so sorry now that I ever went to war <laughs> because Everything I thought I was fighting for has essentially been kicked to the curb. And I asked him, I said, well, aren't you glad to be your age then? Because a lot of the laws that are coming forward maybe are not going to affect you as much. And he said, well, that's true for me, but I've got kids. The generational issue is really important because the, the old guys, um, they see, uh, you know, a limited, limited life going forward. They're not going to be around to really be affected in a profound way over a long period of time. Although, you know, Social Security is at risk, mm -hmm. <laughs> Medicare, Medicaid mm -hmm. is at risk, all that stuff is at risk. Uh, I don't think people realize how much at risk those things are, as well as all these other social programs, not only by, from Trump, but, but from the court as well. Um, I guess what, I, what I'm thinking, though, is that the young people, the millennials, the people who are just coming into the, the electorate and, and in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, um, do they fully understand that they are going to be affected, that their lives are going to be affected for a longer period and maybe in pro more profound ways, and that they have a duty to vote? In Hawaii, we don't seem to put that together. We have a very low, low, low voting rate. Um, and of course, it's not that we can do that much out here, you know, with our votes, our delegation is our delegation. That's what it is. Uh, we don't have that much effect on, on federal legislation beyond that. Um, but, you know, it seems to me that, that these young people, it's their world. It's their world at stake. It's their future and the future of their children at stake. And if they want to fix this, uh, they've got to rise up. Mm -hmm. uh, or their lives will be affected in, in ways more profoundly than the way our lives, I'm, I'm, I'm older than you, the way our lives will be affected. Yeah. Not that much older. <laughs> uh, that's true. I, I agree with you. But I also think that how, how we encourage the younger generation to rise up matters. Um, we remember, say, the 2016 uh, protests right around the time of the inauguration. In 2017, there were more, and now we're seeing even more people taking to the streets to protest 
this most recent Supreme Court nomination and confirmation, et cetera. But the reality is taking it to the street doesn't do much. No. Taking it to the ballot box. That does something. That's where it happens. Yeah. And it's kind of sad to me that, that uh, uh, millennials and Generation Z coming up now are more motivated by what Taylor Swift says than by what they read about in the newspaper or via the um, whatever news media they follow and, and what they're hearing from our government. That's, it's frightening to me. It's frightening in the sense that they're not going to be there to protect the democracy. They're mm -hmm. going to be thinking of other things. And uh, when the rubber meets the road, we'll, we'll have a dictatorship or worse. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's very troubling. And how do you get back from that? This is a result of uh, incomplete education for 30, 40 years. How do you fix that? Well, you need 30, 40 years to fix it. You, if you start teaching these things again, uh, so I, th I think what we have is a really uh, profound systemic problem uh, that has to be addressed. And this government's not going to address it. Uh, it's just you and me. And my final point on that is the press. We, the press is more important to us now than it has ever been. Um, reading, thinking, participating in public conversation is so important now. If we don't do that, we will lose it. Just, you know, the thing about you mentioned uh, the, the, the protests around the time of the inauguration. It's old. We've been distracted 50 times since then. It hasn't happened again. Uh, do we not care? Um, so, that, you know, the point is that somebody has got to be our institutional memory. Mm -hmm. It's got to tell us about what's going on in the White House. It's got to have those op-ed pieces that we saw a couple of weeks ago that tell us uh, all of the things that are happening in the White House and not happening in the White House. And, and unless we follow it, and they have to help us, the press has to help us, uh, we will become just, just objects of distraction, mm -hmm. which is the worst thing we can be. Yeah. And I think, too, we need to uh, make sure that we're getting a balanced news coverage. We can't only be listening to people whose opinions we like. So I probably should be paying equal attention to Rachel Maddow and the folks at Fox News. Uh, and not I have just trouble at doing that, honestly. The Fox News folks? or the Yeah, because sure, if yeah. once I conclude that a news media is lying to me, I have trouble watching it because I don't want to feel that I'm going to get sucked into a lie. Mm -hmm. So I have to have confidence in the news media. Right. And, and the news media is supposed to be a bunch of professionals, but when they come out and regularly give you misinformation, that's a real problem from our democracy for the purpose of maintaining our democracy, we, we really must rely on the press, and the press must see themselves as professional, and they should not affirmatively go around giving us misinformation. The, the penalty we will all pay for that is huge. Yeah, that's true. And unfortunately, it's, it's time for us to end. Uh, so, Jay Fidel, thank you for joining us again today. You know, um, folks out there watching, we all need to vote. We need to make our voices heard, and the best place to do that is in the ballot box. So we need to inform ourselves. We can't take it for granted that the news media or others will do it for us. We need to be informed, and then we need to vote in an informed manner. That's all the time we have today on Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cheryl Crozier-Garcia, and we will be back in two weeks. Till then, take care.